Good morning, AI community, and welcome back to Los Angeles, California. We are here steaming through the day at Terra Data Possible. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be joined by Rob Streche. We're having a lot of fun this morning. I, I think we are, and I think, that, again, it's the topic of AI and data and how they're coming together to really transform companies. It just gets me excited in the morning. I, you know, I, there's a lot that gets me excited in the morning, and I'm glad we share this. Yes, it is, exactly. AI Absolutely. ROI is yes. definitely yes. a thing. Who better to chat with us about it than Martin? Martin, thanks for taking the time and dressing so fabulous for Pleasure. us today. Lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, so Rob and I were interviewing Steve, your fabulous CEO, earlier this morning while you were up there on the main stage. Yeah. Could you give us a little recap so we can get up to speed? Yeah, well, we were talking, I mean, th there's clearly huge excitement about the potential of AI and machine learning right now, but there's also a lot of hype, and there are a lot of organizations that are struggling to know where to start, and a lot of organizations know, struggling to know really how to deliver return on investment from their investments in AI and machine learning. So really the thrust of the presentation was, um, Right now, failure rates are pretty high. We can debate exactly how high, depends which study you trust, but you they're pretty high. You have a stat in here, 80%. 80%, that was based on a recent RAND Corporation survey. Wow. Um, so yeah, obviously, that's a, that's a, that's a thing, right? Yeah, that, you're, uh, <laughs> there's a there there. There, yeah. <laughs> there is, right? You know, we've got, we got a ton of customers here. Um, they're all under pressure from their boards and executives. We've got to be doing something, make mm -hmm. it happen. Uh, and then you look around a room like this and you're thinking, well, if that statistic is right, then four out of five of us are going to come up short. Yeah. And what do I do about that? So really the presentation was analyzing the kind of five most common failure modes around AI and machine learning projects and learning from the mistakes of others so we can do better ourselves. Yeah, I, I think to me, and again, we have similar stats and we've seen that uh, not in addition to the failure rate of POCs and the number of them that are going on, in fact, 84% of companies that we poll through ETR, our, our partner, uh, say they're still in POC, and that's why they haven't gotten to production mm -hmm. yet, because they're, they're trying to figure out what that, that looks like, what is the ROI mm -hmm. and how do we get there. One of the big things uh, that they talk about is they're actually stealing budget from 40% of them are stealing budget from other areas within mm. IT to actually go and fund this. So they want their ROI to be less than a year because they're, they're making these trade-offs. How do you see organizations really focused from a data perspective on getting the data infrastructure right for AI? And what does that really mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that was one of the things that we absolutely talked about today, and it's an incredibly important conversation in the industry right now. If you go back to that RAND survey, 50% of the, the participants in that survey cited data issues as a major contributory factor for failure of AI and machine learning projects. So it's one of the things that you've absolutely got to get right. The presentation, we called it this morning, we called it loading the dice. And if you want to load the dice so that you're one of the 20%, not one of the 80%, Getting the data foundation right is absolutely a smart place to start. And for us, that's really about uh, this concept. Well, it, it, there are many things that are layered in there. Partly it's about uh, the profile of data engineering in organizations sometimes, because mm -hmm. data science is super sexy right now. And so we kind of create these incentives for the best talent sometimes to pursue careers in data science, but data engineering is also really important. No good AI without good data. But the other thing from a data architecture perspective that's really important is building a feature store. When you look at the way a lot of organizations, including some pretty sophisticated organizations, approach their AI and machine learning initiatives, very often what they're doing is they're building these kind of one pipeline per process models. So they go all the way back to the data lake or all the way back to source systems to get more or less the same data, to wrangle it to create very similar features, to train very similar models in the same or adjacent spaces. And there's no reuse in that model. Yeah. And that, that model is just a disaster from a kind of an organizational productivity and a time to market perspective. So one of the key things that we coach our customers to do is to build a feature store and reuse features across multiple models. And, and in terms of uh, improving time to market for new analytics and improving data scientist productivity, it's one of the most important things you can do. How I, I mean, I love that, right? We don't want to be reinventing the wheel all the time. It makes a lot of sense. And, and we see this a lot in the open source community as well, in the way that people share things. How do you help them determine what those features might be? How do you narrow down what's going to be most usable before you've built it across verticals? You know, there are a variety of different approaches. One of the things that Teradata has is a set of industry logical data models, so we've got a very good understanding of the enterprise data assets that serve the big organizations that, that, that we serve, and that's a very important part of our collateral and our assets. Um, but sometimes it's as simple as actually 
just curating the features that are proven to be valuable for one particular project, yeah. putting them someplace where other people can find them, cataloging them so that they can be found. I'll give you a really similar exa simple example. We did a project with a big uh, UK bank a couple of years ago, and they gave us two POC challenges, and we should talk about the POC thing in a minute, by the way, because that's also interesting, Rob, I agree. But they gave us two POC challenges. One was a kind of remote account takeover fraud. I think you guys might call it push fraud. You know, the fraud where the, the fraudster calls you up, pretends to be the bank, mm. right. you send them your money to a safe account, which turns out to be their account. And then the other POC use case they gave us was something called call center deflection. Obviously, every time we pick up the phone to the call center, we cost the bank money, and they would rather we self-served in digital channels. Now, I'm not a banking guy. I'm a technologist, and I studied my career in retail. And on the face of it, those two use cases don't sound to me like they've got a ton in common, right? One's about fraud, one's about customer behavior. Turns out the overlap in the features that you need to train a successful predictive model for those two use cases is between 60 and 70%. Wow. Because what they both have in common, actually, is customer behavior on the mobile channel. And so, yeah, just, just curating features. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just, uh, these features have been useful once. I'm going to make a bet that they're going to be useful again. I'm going to put them where somebody can find them, and I'm going to manage them so that they can be reused across projects. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about it a lot. We talk about AI and agentic type things and chaining them together, to your point. And I, I think this is something where Teradata's been around for a while. AI is not new, sorry, it's just not. I mean, it's been around <laughs> for quite a while. You don't have to apologize to us. I know, yes, I, I, think, know. I, think, I think we, we may, probably maybe, agree. Maybe it was called ML back in the day, but when you started looking at Data model, mining, if we go back far enough. Data mining, yes. Yeah, yes, and analytics, and all of these different names, and big data, and all of that. I, I think one of the things that's always interesting to me is that the customers, and those use cases and how they get from POC to production. Because to me, it, it's, it's, they all want, it. I think it's not about the bot. It's, it's about the bot enabling the human to be better as we talked about and I think Steve talked about on stage this morning. It's about the AI helping make that 20% of the tech in your head as a person, be better, 10,000 times better, yeah. as Radhika talked about. I mean, there's well. so much there. How long do we have, 18 minutes? We could talk yeah. for 18 minutes just about that. But um, there's uh, one of the people that I really respect in the industry is Andrew Ng. And he coined this yeah. phrase a couple of years ago, the idea of this proof of concept to production gap. Mm -hmm. And a lot of organizations are really good at standing up innovation labs, staffing them full of smart PhDs, building really exciting prototypes that then never go anywhere. And of course, there's no return on investment right. if we don't actually get to production, if we don't change the way we do business. And I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a variety of reasons why that happens. But I think uh, a couple of the reasons that we talked about in the presentation this morning, one is people over-rotate on the technology and they over-rotate on the algorithms. It's back to the algorithms are sexy. They are, it's great fun. It's really fun building prototypes, but we don't actually change anything in the business right. by building a model and updating a table of predictions. We've got to actually embed those predictions in an operational business process, change the way we do something. And a lot of organizations don't start with the end in mind and think, if I could predict customer lifetime value, what am I going to do with that prediction? What am I going to do differently? How will I get that prediction where it needs to be in time right. for somebody to do something about it? So that's one critical issue. And then the other issue we see is, especially when you have that kind of innovation lab approach, you give those shiny PhDs all the tools that they want. And they use all these tools and this incredible creativity. And then you get to something that's interesting and you throw it over the wall to somebody else. Hey, go figure, go make that run in production. And of course, if the technologies that you're using aren't technologies that are supported in production or they can't meet production right. service level goals, then your start point is that you've got to re-engineer the whole damn thing to actually go live. So, Balancing this kind of need to use technologies that enable you to innovate quickly with technologies that you can actually support in production is also something that we talk about a lot. And the reason that we talk about our open and connected strategy, which is intended to be a kind of a best of both approach. Tell us, uh, tell us about some of the examples you've seen of this in the wild with customers. Can you give us some case studies? Yeah, so then when the, we talked about that bank, 70% overlap between, um, uh, between um, feature reuse in apparently dissimilar use cases. That's uh, very significant. That is pretty significant. We've got uh, a, 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 an airline customer that's actually here this week that we talked about a little bit this morning. Um, they built a feature store and they said two things that I think are really powerful. One about the value of a feature store in general and the other about uh, the value of Teradata as a feature store platform in particular. So when we asked them, why did you build a feature store? Why did you build it on Teradata? Their first response was, well, building a feature store means that our data scientists can feature on data science. 
And that's a thing as well, right? You know, we know from most of the industry statistics and most of the industry anecdotes that 80% of data scientists spend 80% of their time wrangling and cleaning data. You know, whisper it, they're a pretty expensive resource to have doing that kind of work, right? So yeah, building a feature store enables me to free my data scientists to do data science. And then we said, well, why Teradata? And they said, well, it's where the data are, it's rock solid and mission critical, and it scales and it performs. Actually, they said, why would we build it anywhere else? Which was, was kind of lovely. I bet that was flattering. That was nice. That was a good moment. Not every day at work is a good day, but yeah. that was a good day. <laughs> but, we, but you talked about it, and I, I think this, this is important because I, I think this came through even with the Giants being on stage and talking about how one of the things, and they didn't feel pressured into having to throw all their data into Teradata because a lot of times Teradata is the crown jewels data of a company, yet you want to combine it with some data that's outside of it. Talk to kind of how you talk to organizations because that's part of the, that data wrangling I mean, that, aspect. That open and connected thing really works on three yeah. levels uh, and I'm glad you bring this up. So the particular airline that we were just talking about, the feature store processing runs on Teradata, but because of that open and connected strategy, because of our support for open file formats and open table formats, a lot of those features are actually written someplace else so that multiple tools and technologies can pick them up. And that gives that organization the flexibility to use the right tool for the job rather than being constrained into that kind of, I must use this tool, only this tool is supported. From us, from our point of view, there's also two other really important components in the Clearscape stack to enable that open and connected strategy. The first is this uh, bring your own analytics component. The idea that there's incredible innovation, to your point, Savannah, going on in the open source, and we want people to be able to leverage those libraries. Um, and in particular, the Python yeah. libraries. So the open, the, the bring your own analytics strategy means that we can run those libraries either in database or adjacent to the database. And again, that's another kind of best of both approach. You get the power performance, the scalability of Teradata, but you get the flexibility to use the languages that your data scientists want to use and that are going to make them most productive. And then probably the single most important component in the Clearscape stack, if you took away everything else from me, the one thing I would want you to leave me with was bring your own model. So bring your own model means that- I was just going to bring this well, up. I'm, I'm glad you got there. That is perfect. Means, yeah. that we can, means, that we can run, um, means that we can run models almost regardless of where or how they were trained and with which technology. If you can serialize that model in PMML, Mojo, or Onyx, mostly I can run it in the database at scale and at speed. Um, and again, that's another kind of best of breed approach. If I've got a tool or technology or a group of people that want to use a particular set of tools for model training, they can, and I can still operationalize, I can still deploy it to production. But the other thing that I think is really important in this conversation that's overlooked a lot at the moment is the cost of inference. Particularly if you think about the large language models recently, we've all been focused um, on the cost of training these models, which mm -hmm. is impressive, right? And we can throw some big numbers around. But when you actually think about deployment to production, and when you think about organizations turning the handle on these models millions of times per day, it's the cost of inference that kills you. And so bringing downward pressure to bear on that cost of inference and using simpler models wherever that's appropriate, with that lower unit cost, that's incredibly important. And we've got some lovely statistics about customers saving a boatload of money by moving predictive models to Teradata using that bring your own model capability for inference at scale. You've got a whole BYO culture going on. Bring your own analytics, bring your own models. Pretty much, yeah. You, accept, you seem very accepting. You, you, you allow everyone to show up as they are well, and, and help structure that. It, it, it is, you know, it's been a bit of a cultural thing, honestly, over yeah. the last couple of years. The Teradata I joined 20 years ago did not have that mindset in the same way. Um, but you know, when you look at the, the levels of innovation, particularly in the AI ML community and the open source community, mm -hmm. you've absolutely got to help customers exploit that level of innovation. I think sometimes there's a kind of false choice presented to customers at the moment, right? There's the tried and tested stuff that scales and works in production, or there's the new stuff that might enable me to innovate faster. Well, that's a terrible choice. I want both of those things at the same right. time, right? I'm a greedy guy. <laughs> I, I, you haven't presented too greedy to us, but I think you brought something up that I, I, I want to go back to cost of inference and also speed of inference, these are the things that are going to make AI real to the everyday human being out there and our friends and family. Do you find that that's perhaps part of the reason that we're seeing this 80% fail rate in these AI experiments is the lack of consideration for the inference on that side? I think that's absolutely, it comes back to this lack of consideration for the operationalization. You know, right. I'm going to build it in the lab. Oh, damn, but now I've actually got to move it to production. Can I even afford to move it to production? Never mind, can I support production service level goals? I think the other thing is that that kind of, um, that focused on biggest that we've had for the last couple of years. You know, I have a trillion parameter large language model. Ha, that's so yesterday. I have a one and a half trillion <laughs> parameter large language model. We kind of miss the fact that, um, 
actually what matters is what works. And it's been a truism in, mm -hmm. in AI and machine learning for as long as I've been involved in the field that the best model is the simplest model that's sufficiently accurate for your use case. There, are a t there is a time and a place when only a one and a half trillion parameter large language model will do, right? If I want to write an outbound email to ABC One demographic customers to sell them the new iPhone 16, I need that level of power and performance and scalability. If I want to rapidly process 600,000 emails to try and identify which ones are examples of mis-selling, I don't need that level of power and performance and flexibility. What I need is scale, what I need is performance, and what I need is to optimize for unit costs. And that comes back to this conversation around agentic AI, right? When you get all done, what is agentic AI? It's chained models, Multi a multiple different models performing different things, and I chain the results together. Right. And, and actually, there's a real place for uh, smaller, less complex models that we can inference better, faster, cheaper, and at Absolutely. scale, and that, again, that was another big topic of, of the presentation this morning. We talked about a, a, some work we're doing with one of the big US banks right now, where we're actually able to use task-specific language models in database on Teradata at vastly better levels of performance, scalability, and cost than using a, a, a large language model, which in this case is a kind of sledgehammer to crack a nut. I, I think, well, those are great examples. I think everybody wants a better banking experience, just even on the customer user experience side of that. No offense to my bank, but no, I think... No, I no, think no, no comment, given that 50% of Teradata's customers are financial services. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stay away from that, yeah. Savannah. Well, that, yeah. that's why they got to stay working with you, though, so that that experience can evolve and yeah. you don't get disrupted. I think, I think it actually comes back to a point of you, you being the right partner to go along with that. You've been at Teradata, you mentioned, for two so decades. So just real quick on yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, because I think um, we, we had a, a financial services session yesterday, actually, for some of our leading financial services customers. And you're absolutely right. The, the, the multi-structured data, text, audio, email, that is the sweet spot for these Gen AI technologies right now. We yeah. can extract meaningful signals of customer intent from that data. And in an awful lot of B2C organizations, not just the banks, that data's captured and then nothing happens with it. And actually I think that the most single most exciting thing about some of these new gen AI technologies is we're finally, finally, finally going to be able to do what we've said we want to do with that data for 20 years, which is really leverage to understand the customer journey, mm -hmm. to understand what's going on in the lives of our customers and to do something about it. And, and to customize that experience so they continue to build, which is one of the cornerstones here at Teradata, trust. Yeah. Trust within that data, that organization, the, the partner that you're working with, whoever that might be. You've been at the company for two decades, you said? Yeah, very nearly, yeah. How has the culture evolved? Was it always a culture of innovation? It feels very innovative here today. And I think it was always a culture of innovation, yeah. for sure. Um, uh, no question about it. I mean, Teradata was the, the, the company that commercialized the massively parallel processing model back in the day. So there's always been a, a, a strong culture of innovation. I think that openness is a relatively new thing. That's, a, mm, that's a, 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 a change in the culture. There was a time when uh, we wanted to own all of the data, all of the processing, and uh, you know, we weren't that much interested uh, beyond a, a, a set of important strategic partnerships to get data into the database and to get data out of the database. We weren't that interested in, for example, working with the open source technologies. And I think that changed for us um, when the big data thing happened again, Rob, to, to your yeah. point, kind of 10, 12 years ago. And it also changed with this uh, executive leadership team that, that Steve brought in around him when he joined the company. He's been a big champion and a big driver of that. That's exciting. All right, since you have been there for a little while and you're a lovely guest, we'd love to have you back. What do you hope to be able to say when we're at Teradata Possible next year that you can't yet say today? Now, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the Gen AI for CX, as we're calling it now, for customer experience, mm -hmm. and right now we've got a handful of customers working with that. I think that's relevant to just about every B2C customer that works with Teradata, which is 75, 80% of them. So I'd love to be able to look you in the eye next year and tell you that we've really moved the needle on that. That would be a big deal for those companies. It'd be a big deal for Teradata too. I love it, Martin. Well, I hope you can look me in the eye and say precisely that next year. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us thank today. You. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank and thank you, Rob. Always a blast. I'm, yes. I'm vibing with it. And thank all of you for tuning in wherever you might be on this absolutely beautiful California day. We're here in Los Angeles at Teradata Possible. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.